This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Very uh, special show today. Important show. Probably the reason the Rich Dad Company was founded. Uh, August 15th, 1971. A man named Tricky Dick Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. And most people don't even remember it because he announced it during a TV show called Bonanza. So I think most people were watching Bonanza rather than Tricky Dick. And uh, But that 1971 change, August 15th, 1971, the 50th anniversary is coming up in a few days. So I thought we'd commemorate that and explain what happened. But since I'm the oldest guy on this show, I'll give you a little history of what happened before 1971. Um, back in the 1950s, uh, people didn't invest in stocks. I remember my rich dad's having a, an employee who was playing the stock market and rich dad said, that guy's a gambler. You know, back then it was a thing called a nifty 50 and this that's all he talked about was a nifty 50. And now this is the difference. My rich dad was an entrepreneur and entrepreneurs don't need to invest in stocks because they create their own assets. So that was in the 1950s. And if anybody did anything, they saved money. And prior to 1971, it was really smart to save money because after 1971, they started printing it. So back in 19, prior to 1971, when I was a kid, people saved money, gamblers were in the stock market and people bought bonds because bonds were safe because they weren't printing money. And I remember as a kid, I had, to, I had a little bank that said Bishop Bank, which today is First Hawaiian Bank. And I would save my little pennies and all that, take it down there and I put it in my little passbook and I got it all 3% or whatever it was. It wasn't much. And then we bought US savings bonds. So I still remember the numbers, you know, not good at numbers, but I do like dollar signs in front of them. If you put $18.75 into a savings bond, in 10 years, it got 25 bucks. Now it didn't excite me because 10, 10 years when you're only 10 years old is a long time. So I said, oh boy, in 10 years, I got 25 bucks. You know, like somehow it didn't register for me, but my rich dad kept saying, that's the smart thing to do. So he rich dad had bonds and he built his own assets. He was a real estate guy, because as you guys know, as Ray Kroc of McDonald's says, the purpose of a business is to buy real estate. So he starts set up businesses, he'd buy real estate and he put it in, he had a, a residential property, which my poor dad called slumlords, slums. And what they were are basically large tracts of land that he would put Quonset huts on, because Quonset huts were the, was, was military surplus after World War II. And then my job and Richard had son of me, our job was to go collect rent. If you want an edu you want a financial edu education, go collect rent. I tell you, you hear more bullshit than you ever hear in your whole life. And when I talked to Donald Trump, he says that was one of the best experiences his father ever gave him was to collect rent. <laughs> and you hear more stuff. So anyway, after 1971, they started printing money. And that's when 1972, I started buying gold because I understand what's going on, that 87 was a big stuff. Oh, what happened in 71 was that, 74 was the ERISA, Employee Retirement Income Security Act, which then forced everybody into the stock market. So I remember my rich dad saying, this is those freaking guys, they're putting all these, not, these people who are idiots into the stock market. They don't even know what they're doing. And so the whole retirements were now based upon a thing called the 401k, also called a DC, a defined contribution plan. And, and certain employees like from Ford Motor Company and the government had defined benefit plans. That was, 74 was a major change. Again, 71, 74. And then came the 87 stock market crash and a few people understood that it wasn't as understood the thing about gambling. And, you know, I was watching this, then came the Glass-Steagall, they re repealed Glass-Steagall, I think around 1995 or something like that. Tricky, I mean, Clinton did that one. And what Glass-Steagall did is it took, a, it made commercial banks and investment banks the same. You could gamble. And th there was so much corruption that came when you had investment banks 
and regular savings banks getting together. So they start putting savings of the savers into the stock market. That's what the repeal of Glass-Steagall did. Then we had the crash of 2000, which they called the dot-com crash. Then came 2008, and they call it a subprime. They call it a subprime mortgage crash, and they blame the poor people for the crash. But it wasn't the poor people who did it. Again, it was Wall Street, the Treasury, and the Fed. And then they never fixed the problem. They never, never fixed the problem. And all they did was print more money. So 1971 continued on in mass after 2008. And today in 2021, I'll give you a, a number. They started coming up with a thing called quantitative easing. And what the quantitative easing was to do was to keep money into the economy because it was like this huge hot air balloon going in the sky that if that hot air balloon came down, the little gondola was you and me. So if that gondola, that big balloon didn't stay in the sky and it started to empty, the crash would be the, gon the little gondola below it, and that's us. We'd get crushed. So what happened? With the, so what happened was, I still remember they came. I forgot which which Fed chairman it was. Says QE three is going to fix it. This is the bazooka. We're going to print so much money that will fix the problem forever. So in, in QE three, they are putting I think eighty billion a month into the economy. Eighty billion. Today, it's 120 billion. They're trying to keep this hot air balloon in the sky because of this balloon and hanging below it is you and me. So that's where we are. And that's why the 50th anniversary is coming up. And if that balloon comes down, it's going to be a big one. So this special edition of Rich Dad Radio is the 50th anniversary of Tricky Dick taking the US dollar off the gold standard. And then, like I said, it happened in 1971. Savers became the biggest losers. So I never save money anymore. I save gold, silver, Bitcoin, but not money. And what happened in 1971, debt became money and taxes. Because if you understand how money works <clears throat> to print money, you have to have taxes to offset it. So it's debt and taxes. So today we have very special dear friends for years and years and years. Ken McElroy, who's our specialty on debt, and Tom Wheelwright, who's our specialist on, expert on how not to pay taxes using debt, and Kim. So let Kim's, because Kim, these guys have made us freaking millions of dollars, haven't they? Yes, they have. Yes, they have. We're very grateful to both of them. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, and I, 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 Pretty sure when Nixon, 50 years ago, I'm sure they never envisioned what it would be like today, but 50 years ago, he said it was temporary. He said it was temporary, just like COVID lockdown was temporary. Um, so if I, and if I understand correctly, Robert, by taking the US dollar off the gold standard also gave way to the dollar just devaluing, devaluing over time, correct? Uh, it got worse than that because if, that didn't fix the banking system. It's a thing called the fractional reserve system. And there's all this stuff called Griffin's Dilemma and all this stuff that I studied that nobody, nobody cares about. But today there's a Euro dollar system. In other words, not the Euro. There's more dollars overseas that are US dollars and they're doing the same thing. <laughs> what it is, is it's called the fractional reserve. <laughs> you save $10, they can lend out a hundred. That's the system. So there's more U.S. dollars floating out there, and and nobody knows how big the problem is. It's not about that. That answers the question. But it, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like Frankenstein's monster. Yeah. Fifty happy fiftieth anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome Tom and welcome Ken. Always great to have you guys on the show. Thank Always you. good to be here. Uh, what a great show to be on. Yeah. Well, you, and, and Robert, you said as when that happened, that um, when savers become losers and debtors got rich. So the more debt we have, the better off we are because that debt is cheap. Right. I mean, what happened after 2000, I remember Kenny and I were laughing because, you know, I was at Safeway and the Safeway checkout girl, this is prior 2007 or 2006 our vacancies and our apartments were going up because everybody was becoming homeowners. 
<laughs> they could buy a house for a ninja loan, not, no income, no job. If they fogged a mirror, they got a house. They were just so desperate because for the what happened in 1971, if people stopped borrowing, it stopped. You had to have debt. So today we have student loan debt, credit card debt. Uh, everybody wants to buy new cars and all this because debt became the engine of the economy. Tom, is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, and and uh, tax uh, taxes are the way you pay for debt. So, can, so, and, so and again, can, most, and again, most people only think of debt as bad yeah. debt. They yeah. only think of it as bad. There's actually very yeah. good debt if you know what you're doing. No, but that's the key. Like Dave Ramsey says, "Live debt free," and I agree with him. If you're an idiot, don't borrow money. But you ha the reason we have Kenny and Tom on is Kenny's books teach you how to borrow money and can and Thomas books tell you how not to pay taxes. This is the irony of it all is twice a year, we have to call Kenny and say, Kenny, we need more debt. Kenny, why is that? Well, you said it in the intro, Robert. Uh, I mean, you kind of just skipped over it because you, you know, you, you're so well read, but I think when you said debt became money, I, I think that a lot of people have a stigma around debt. Okay. You know, it's kind of a, kind of a bad word. And, and for many it is, you know, credit card debt, you know, that's kind of what gets a lot of the media attention, but you know, we're borrowing, as you know, from banks <laughs> at 3% or less. And we already know just in the last few months, inflation is reported uh, finally higher, way higher than, than, than we're borrowing. So why wouldn't you borrow other people's money in the form of debt? Because you're actually, it's like, it's like taking money from people and fixing it at three and, and inflation's your friend right now. So, you, you know, you're crazy um, as, as you know, to save money because your purchasing power on that money is eroding each and every month. And it's starting to show up in the numbers. Yeah, and, and Kim and I panic when Kenny doesn't have a deal because without Kenny, we don't borrow money. So, Tom, why is that important that we borrow money? We go into debt with Kenny, Kim and I. Well, be, be, because you need assets. Um, assets, uh, building assets is how you reduce your taxes. And uh, the more debt you have, the more assets you can, you can uh, acquire. So it's all about the assets. And then on top of that is that when we have the assets, then three things kick into place. Amortization, appreciation, deep, uh, appreciation. And they're all tax free. Right. That's right. right. So the whole system was happening from 1971. As I said, debtors became the winners and savers became the losers. And if you can understand that, that's why this 50th anniversary is so, so important. And I still hear people saying, save money. Tom, I remember as a kid, Rob, uh, Robert, I remember as a kid when my parents paid off their house, how, how happy they were, you know, because back then it made sense. You know, they, they bought the house in the fifties and the sixties, the house I grew up in. I remember to this day when my, my, my dad and my mom and they hugged in the kitchen and they were like, we paid off the house, you know, because it meant something at the time, but that all changed. So, so, Tom, give us the, the technical side or the, the internal revenue side on debt. Why, why do they want us to be in debt? Why they incentivize us? Well, so what they do is they say, look, the more assets you have, the less taxes you pay. I mean, that's that's rule number one. The more assets you have, the less taxes you pay. They want uh, the, the federal government wants you to put your money into productive assets like uh, housing, like um, commercial real estate, like energy, uh, agriculture, business, all of these things are productive assets. And the more assets you have then, uh, for, every ass for every dollar of asset you buy, you get a dollar deduction from your tax. So if you make a million dollars, you need, um, uh, you need to borrow money so that you can buy $5 million of assets so that you can offset that million dollars of income. Otherwise you're gonna pay $400,000 on that million dollars of income. So the, what the government's saying is, look, if you borrow money and buy more assets, you'll pay less tax. 
And, and, and what's funny is about twice a year, I'm on the phone with Kenny begging. <laughs> Kenny, I need more debt. Right? I yeah. Mean, you have a lot of guys like that, Kenny, right? They need, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I'm in the same boat as, I mean, we all are. You know, we all know that, that, uh, as, that debt is your friend. Uh, you, you know, why wouldn't you borrow other people's money, <laughs> buy real estate, and then have other people pay it off for you? <laughs> If, and then you get the tax write offs, you know, so you get income plus you get the tax benefits for that. Can I add one more thing? Tom, 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 this is it. If we sell our property, if we flip it, we have a tax consequence, don't we? If you, if you do flipping, you do. You have ordinary, you have regular ordinary income if you're a flipper. So if I, if I borrow out the equity, what is that? That's not taxable because that's not taxable. Yeah. Kim, is that what we do? That is what we do. That is what we do. And I wanted to say that to Kenny's point, um, I bet there's a lot of people watching this right now that are going, oh yeah, that's good. But you know, the prices are too high today. So there's no deals out there. And we just closed on a deal. What a few weeks ago. So, you, you know, you know, Kim, I, I'm an accountant. So I, I always look at the numbers and I'm going, if, if, if the money that's coming in is more than the money that's going out, who cares? But the other thing too, make Tim, point, there are there are a lot of opportunities out there, even though markets are kind of crazy right now. If you know what you're looking for. But on the 50th anniversary, I think this is really funny. Like Bezos, Branson, and all those guys are riding the rocket ships, and Kim just bought her lair. What for 60? <laughs> right. So yeah. Tom, why well, was buying her her own lair jet? It's not it's not a rocket ship, but it's pretty fast. It actually is a rocket ship. <laughs> <laughs> so how was that a tax break for Kim? Well, you, you know, it's 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 actually it's an asset, right? So uh, what I've noticed about you and Kim is you guys never buy a liability; you always buy an asset. So you're always buying something that's going to produce income. Well, what the government says is, and this is true in every country, if you buy an asset that produces income, then you can deduct, you can write off the asset. If it doesn't produce income, you can't. So if you buy, if you bought a plane and just used it for personal purposes, you wouldn't get to write that off, but because your plane makes money, you can write that off. And our, and our plane makes money because it's in a charter fleet uh, of a company. So it is being, it's used as a charter plane regularly. And it's exactly like the properties we buy with Kenny yep. there in our rental mm -hmm. too. Yep. So what you're yeah. understanding is true yeah. capitalism here. So we come back with big finishing up final words from these people on the 50th anniversary of Tricky Dix Nixon's taking the dollar off the gold standard. It's just when the stock market is all time highs, real estate is all time highs, bond market is all time highs and the big balloon is in the sky and they keep filling it more and more with hot air. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Hughes, Second Three Chat Radio Show, the good news and bad news about the 50th anniversary of Tricky Dick Nixon taking the dollar off the gold standard, August 15th, 1971 and how it changed the world. And then in 1974, everybody went into, the, they were pushed into this thing called a 401k. And back in 1971, let me remind you, it was smart to save. There was a thing called the magic of compounding interest. I actually bought savings bonds because it was a smart thing to do. And my rich dad says, he didn't, he says, uh, people were in the stock market were gamblers. They called it the Nifty 50. Those are the big stocks at the time. And then Tricky Dick took it off the gold standard and it just got worse and worse and worse. I think the biggest one was repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, which allowed you know, mom and pop banks to merge with investment banks. It just went to this big casino. And now we're sitting at the biggest bubble in world history, I think, has never been this big. I'll tell you a quick story. I was watching the Milwaukee Sun, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Bucks, play the Phoenix Suns. I was sitting at the bar, uh, Tomaso's Kim, and there was a woman there with her husband. She says, I'm a realtor. I go, oh my God. And um, she's just sitting there with her accountant. And I'm going, oh my God. And she says, you want to buy some real estate? I said, so I pointed to our building behind Tomaso's Kim. I said, that's real estate. You know, that's a real investment. We've been it for 25 years. We're never going to sell it. We don't pay taxes on it. We make a lot of money on it. And so their accountant is sitting there. So this Tom, this is the tax problem. She's been a realtor for five years in the biggest the bull market going up. 
So she's made a lot of money on commissions as she started flipping. She started buying and flipping. So now they have severe tax problems because they haven't paid any taxes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and so the, the accountant is a big fat guy eating his cannoli. <laughs> so I wish you were there, Tom. So I asked him, I said, what do you recommend? <laughs> 